Here we go. My name is Chris Lesso, LTR Drumming, your best self through drumming. This is amazing. As you improve your focus, confidence, and self-expression, you, you can become more of who you are on the drums as we do this crazy thing where we, we hit stuff with wood. And isn't this freaking awesome what we're doing here? <laughs> so let's get into it. Crash, crash. What does that mean? It's an acronym, C-R-A-S-H. That stands for commitment, relationships, attitude, skill, and hunger. And this is what we go into with the, the amazing Rich Redmond. And what I wanna do, like you can probably tell I'm slightly crazy and enthusiastic about this. And I wanna share what I learned in my journey with the world basically, and I'm gonna to get to share this with you today. And Rich has, I've learned so much from Rich Redmond. He's inspired me, who he is as a person, and of course his drumming. And this really is about drumming with attitude. And it's, it's the A in crash. And that's what a, a really cornerstone of what Rich teaches through that acronym and, and so much more. But just every note he plays, you can feel the energy, the love, and the attitude. And that's what this is about. We come together and we're stronger together. And that's why we, we all share our joy of what we're doing as we face the inevitable challenges that come up. And that's, what's, that's what we all go through. Sometimes we go through it around the world. Sometimes we go through it in our personal lives. We're always gonna face challenges. So we get into this today. We get Rich's best advice, and I, I've wanted to bring him in for a while to share with my community. So we had him as a guest in the LTR Livecast. You're gonna experience this right now. What happened when we all came together for this live mastermind with Rich and to, to benefit from all that he is on the drums and in life. So if you wanna go deeper, hit me up at chrislesso.com, and it's the LTR Connect program where we go deeper into this every month we have mastermind workshops uh, challenges you get a monthly pdf agenda it's it's fantastic it's fun and it's so awesome we come together you're going to get personal feedback from me we and other students and special guests like rich redmond and so much more so check it out but for today see it live with Rich Redmond and see how much we all got out of it. We were all blessed to be with him today. I learned so much from Rich, I'm inspired. So let's become your best self through drumming with Rich Redmond. And yes, we welcome everybody in here. This is Rich Redmond, I haven't seen you in person for a while, but you've inspired me so much with just your drumming, your your books, your videos. Uh, Rich has a ton of stuff. Go to richredmond.com. It's all there. We'll get into that. But all my students are very familiar with your crash system, as am I. I had it laminated. It's in my wallet. It's it's plaqued in my studio. I, I love the, the concept of it. So... As we go through this crisis together, there are certain things that can kind of make things worse and, and be almost therapeutic to, to, to make us actually better as, as we go through this. And drumming is, is, of course, what that is. And within drumming is the music and drumming community as we all come together in a mastermind kind of way as we are right now. We're all going to leave this better than we were when we came in and which is the definition of synergy i love that definition of synergy it's like one plus one equals three right <laughs> so yeah part of the goal is when we look back on this time and say wow i actually got better during this time and, and how to do this and the crash system if you could just break that down yeah yeah guys um so yeah I, it just could be like a broken record but i'll just reinforce what chris is you know, been uh, been teaching you. You got a great teacher there, highly motivational, highly skilled. 
So you're in good hands there. But, you know, the idea with crash is just, it's just a system for success. You know, if you want to be successful at anything, so it's easy to remember. So commitment, relationships, attitude, skill, and hunger. So, I mean, you're showing your commitment by being here today on this crazy new technology that we probably wouldn't be doing unless we had this thing. So there are some good things coming out of this. Um, but the idea that when you commit to something, it starts in the mind, right? Like when people want to quit smoking or lose weight or achieve a goal, you know, they have an idea. And then when you have that idea and you commit to that idea and you get up every day and you just make incremental steps towards your goals, it all starts with commitment. So you have to decide first in the mind and then just roll up your sleeves and uh, get busy. And the idea of relationships, the idea that, you know, we are stronger than just ourselves. And, you know, every time I want to try to accomplish something in life, you have two camps. You have one group of people that are like, anytime you have a goal or a desire to accomplish something, you keep it a secret. You keep it close to your chest before somebody beats you to the punch, right? But what I do is I just send it out into the ether and I call all my friends and I say, hey, can you help me with this? Do you have any additional resources or insights that I can use to achieve this thing that I want to do? And most of the things that I've, I've achieved in my life have been, of course, from the sweat of my brow, but I am uh, not afraid at all to enlist the help of other like-minded people, right? So being drummers, we know about being part of a community. Attitude. Um, attitude is that one thing, no matter what, people will always remember about you. You know, you can pull up to the curb with a, you know, a gorgeous, uh, you know, Italian car and fitted clothing and diamonds, Rolex and nice haircut. People might remember for a day or two, but they're always going to remember the, your attitude and the enthusiasm that you brought to the table and um, how you make people feel in your presence, right? Because most people just want to work with people they know, like, and trust. So it's very important to be a likable person. Sometimes I would consider it yeah, it's an expectation for you to be able to, you know, hold the sticks, do a twirl, know your rudiments, know what a quarter note is, play, play a, a good feeling beat. But when I play music with people, I want to play music with people that are likable. I know them. I know part of their history. You finish each other's sentences and I can trust them, right? So being likable. I don't know if it's teachable. I don't know if there's a science behind it, but you just want to try to be a person that shows up, um, enthusiastic with a smile on your face with a firm handshake and you're open to suggestions because let's face it as a drummer very seldom are we making choices usually we're having to respond to the desires of a producer or a club owner or a band or an engineer or a songwriter you know we're like one of the most important pieces of the puzzle but at the same time you know, we're like um, the forgotten stepchild where it's like, yeah, get the drummer in there, you know? <laughs> um, so you kind of have to embrace, you know, that role and just kind of know what you're getting yourself into and then skill. And that's why you're studying with Chris, you know, having the skills you need to be successful in what you want to do as a drummer. So I outline that. I like, okay, this is how you hold the sticks. And then we get into tone production, stroke, and then we get into technique and technique is just a means for us to be able to express ourselves on the instrument. And then we get into four-way coordination. And then from there, we get into playing styles and then click tracks and then maybe studying percussion. So in college, I studied percussion. So I had to spend time on classical snare drum, marching snare drum, yeah, timpani, timpani, vibraphone, marimba, um, glockenspiel, like anything you could beat, rattle, scrape, shake. You know, they gave me a master's degree in it. And that was a lot of hope. showing up. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am jumping through hoops that were on fire and I did it in seven years and no one can take it away from me. Right. Does it have as much value as it did at 20 years ago, a college education? I don't know, but you young bucks right there. I think, um, I think in Canada, they make it easier for you to go to college, I think. And it's, so if that's the case, do it for sure, because it's only four years of your life and you come out and you have some skills and, um, and then the last piece is hunger, which is the idea of hunger is that passion is your engine and hard work is your fuel. So if you choose something like drums that you're passionate about, it's so easy to roll up your sleeves and work hard and fuel that engine with hard work because it doesn't feel like work. And that goes back to the old, you know, saying that the harder you work, the luckier you get. And it becomes like our friend Dom Famularo, a cycle of self-empowerment, which is a yes. great book that that I highly recommend. So this stuff all works together in synergy because unless, unless you're hungry, you might not commit. 
But when, then once you commit, you can bring a great attitude to the table while you're cultivating relationships that you need for success in your life while you're developing your skill. So you can use any of these five compo uh, components individually, but when you use them in perfect synergy, it's like, I don't want to say it's foolproof because, you know, the music business is, um, it's a dying art form, you know, it's been, it's been dying, it's been on its knees for a long time because of file sharing. And now we have a pandemic, which is also changing the way that people are going to perceive music. Because think about this. Sometimes people will spend $2.99 for a fart app on their phone, right? But they won't spend <laughs> 99 cents for a song that's a work of art, right? So you got to realize almost like what you're getting into is um, it's the Wild West. <laughs> And you have to really make your own success. Is there work out there for people that want to be paid to play their instrument? Yeah, but you got to hustle. You got to be willing to play those supermarket grand openings and those bar mitzvahs and bot mitzvahs and play those college campuses and dive bars and and uh, corporate parties and pool parties and play on free demos for the next hit songwriter because when that hits when that guy starts getting some success he to remember that you worked on his behalf and he's going to take you along for the ride that's exactly what i did with a young jason aldean we were we were young and broke and you know four guys jumped in a van and we started playing shows and we we thought those shows were like we treated those shows like they were Madison Square Garden. And then, you know what? We got to play Madison Square Garden because we treated every situation like that. Awesome. So I hope that helps. But it's, uh, you know, it's something that you can use, you know, for yourself. It's right there. Let's get um, it. You know, I've been speaking on this thing and teaching this thing for like over 12 years. And I finally said, you don't need to write this down. Um, so it's finally, it's finally out there, you know. And that's a, that's a theme, Rich. I love that you brought that up of like – the treating every gig like it's Madison Square Garden, literally, because this right. is, you know, if someone asks you to play drums with people, even if there's like one person in the audience, and I've literally played to one person in the audience, as I'm sure you did, the band outnumbered. Oh yeah, for sure. The audience, right? But that yeah. that is a sacred thing, and and we can never become jaded and and lose sight of that. It's like you're playing drums, creating music in the moment. And even if yeah. there's one person there, that's like you have a chance to uplift that person through drumming and music. And we had Randy Cook on last week, Mike yeah. Smith, uh, a couple weeks ago. And we just keep hearing this, this story over and over. Our, our mutual friend, Chris Sutherland, it's like if you trace yeah. the gig, like, wow, I'm playing Madison Square Garden right now. But if you trace it back, it's like it started out with this you know, crazy situation where you have to find the motivation within. It's not coming from money and it's not coming from external. It's coming, the hunger's got to come from inside. Like Randy Cook last week told the story about when he moved to LA and his, he, he just got this gig being in a disco band and it was like, you know, 60 bucks or something had to drive three hours. And he, and he said, I'm driving back from the gig all sweaty. I've got my wig in the passenger seat of my car, you know, and, and he's like, what am I doing? Like, this is, this is, this yeah. is crazy that I'm doing this, but he's like, I'm happy. I'm fulfilled. And yeah. it led to one thing led to another. And mm -hmm. I love that you said how, how all the pieces connect with one another. So that's, that's beautiful. And I've had students come in and sometimes we look just off the cuff. We look at the crash acronym and we say, okay, what does commitment mean to you today? You know, and it could mean, wow, I had, a really challenging practice session this week or, or in the last few months, even going through a lot of anxiety, hitting a lot of walls that seem like walls, but sometimes they're just the bottom of the next step to overcome. Right. And just how each of these pieces means something each, each day, even, you know, like relationships can be different as you go uh, attitude, you know, and sometimes I'll bounce it off a student like, Okay, for me, attitude today means just being in gratitude that we get to play the drums. And mm -hmm. then um, a student might say, well, that's cool that you said that. But to me, it means making more drummer faces and just bringing out more energy in my play or something like that. Yeah. So if you could just uh, maybe th this, this, you know, pandem pandemic we're going through has never happened in human history. 
how, how yeah. does this kind of how does this kind of apply now for drummers in this moment? Do you think? Well, you know, as as uh, and we, you know, God bless Randy Cook. We've all done those disco gigs. I've, I've done the same gigs with the wigs yep. and the suspenders and all that. The whole the whole deal. Um, but you do it because look what's going to come out of it. More good is going to come out of it than bad. So you're going to connect with other fellow human beings. You're going to work on your craft, developing your skill, getting closer to those tens, tens of thousands of hours that you need. And you're going to make a little bit of money. And then you never know when you, sh what sh hand you're going to shake on that job. And next thing you know, you know, Randy probably met some guys on that gig that led to him working with Ringo or playing with Smash Mouth. And it's like, if you treat all the bi all the tiny gigs like big gigs, you'll get big gigs. You know, they will eventually come. Um, but, um, but yeah, I think we're, this is a great time for, you know, as drummers, we're always running around, doing rehearsals, having to schlep in and out, playing the bar gigs. We're busy in our career so so now we can take time to like revisit things like working on your rudiments and play, so maybe sitting in front of a mirror and looking at your stick height you know because i was in the marching band for eight years and i had to play with 10 other guys and we had to be you know perfectly precise and that helped me my technique and so maybe you work on your technique or maybe you work on expanding a style that you've wanted to work on you know usually i have about I don't know, about 15 styles minimum. I like to, you know, teach people, even if you guys just know the basic beat. And that's the first step with styles is like you would learn a two, four country shuffle, a four, four country shuffle, a rock shuffle, um, a, like a, a double shuffle, like a Chicago or a Texas shuffle. You get a halftime shuffle going, right? Then you have a train beat. Then you have a Motown beat. Then you have a soca, a partido alto, a samba, a bossa nova, a merengue, um, a smooth jazz groove, a Southern California, like double, you got, you got, you got, you got, you got, that thing, you start jazz, and you start getting into the jazz ride cymbal pattern and being able to express yourself playing other, so we're, our job as drummers is there's always something to work on, right? So if, if you're playing in a rock band right now, maybe it's a, a great time to literally, literally start exploring jazz, because jazz is like a uniquely North American art form, right? Which also led to the birth of the drum set, which led to early rock and roll, which led to the British invasion. So really, if you want to understand this instrument, you really have to, it's, it's, it, it would serve you well to go back and for sure, get some of that stuff going. Swing and maybe pulse, you just yeah. start with like, yeah, maybe you just start with like Tommy Dorsey and Glenn Miller, you know, ba -ba -doo, ba -ba 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 -ba. you start there and get swinging. And because from me, learning how to swing, even though maybe I'm a little rusty because I don't play that style all the time, it's like wearing an old shoe because I did it since the eighth grade jet pep band. And then I worked my way all the way up to the top band at University of North Texas where we recorded and we toured. It was like a professional jazz band. And now I play country and Western music, right? But I play that style differently than all of my peers, just like you would all play the music differently because we're all like snowflakes. We're all these unique individuals that are all shaped by what we listen to, who we spend our time with, who we study with. We're an amalgamation of all of, all of our influences. So now is a great time to just work on things like technique playing with records, working on your reading, locking with a click track. Maybe you buy a hand drum and you finally get your slap together on your conga. So um, it's, if you're a self-starter, this is a perfect time in human history to take your game to the next level. I love that. And, and there's a saying that I love. It's like, never waste a good crisis. I think Churchill, <laughs> right? It's like, yeah, and that, that seems to be a, a common theme, Rich, we're hearing is like, this is the time, like Randy was talking about stick heights, which is going, you know, just like getting in front of the mirror, that's the skill, and just getting really granular with like measuring the inches and just going yeah. back to basics, going back to jazz, uh, listening to that Gene Krupa album that you never had time to listen to before, right? So we, we got some questions coming in, guys. Uh, hit me with the questions, Facebook Live, on the chat, anything. We're, we're live with Rich. This is awesome. I'm going to hit you, Rich, with some Rich Redmond stories that I love and that inspire me, and I want to get your just, just take on them. You ready? I got it. So, and I said this to Randy, and he's like, oh, boy, what story is he going <laughs> to? <laughs> Randy's got a lot of stories. Right. 
So that's one thing we actually forgot to ask Randy about. So we're going to do a part two on that. Um, but first one is, is I think you told this story or I don't know if I read it, but it's, you're playing these, these giant places with, with Jason Aldean, right? I know you played the, the small places too, but I think you said that like before the gig, you, you, you kind of in the empty arena and you, you literally went all the way to the level 400 nosebleeds just to sit there and, and maybe during the opening act or maybe before, you know, during sound check or something just to go, okay, I have to play with such infectious enthusiasm and attitude that it's going to hit this person in the 400s, in the nosebleeds, literally at the back of the arena. Is that true? Um, that we need, that I need to do that? That you Bring literally that energy? did that? Because you play like Oh, that. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I have a tradition, like, uh, I'm, I'm not really big on heights. I'm not a height guy, you know, but I will go, we'll play some of these larger venues and I will go to the, literally, I will seek out the highest seat and I will force myself through my fear to get up there so I can witness the amount of energy that needs to be projected in that place from the drum seat because the people in the, in the front row, they're the true believers. They've paid the high ticket price. And, you know, think about going to a concert. I'm sure all of us we're going to be a little leery about it, but I mean, I think we're all craving that human interaction ball getting in this one place at the same time and expressing something together. But those people, you know, they had to pay $20 for a babysitter, $20 to park, $20 a beer, you know, their tickets are super steep. And then the people that are in the nosebleeds are a little bit cheaper and they might be on the fence about who is this guy and why are we going to see that person? So my goal is to send my energy out there and to make those people true believers. So the people keep coming back to the show, they keep listening to the records and I still have a job, you know? <laughs> So um, you reap what you sow. So I, I like to just play like it's the last time I'm ever going to play it. Because you know what? You never know. You never know. Tomorrow is not promised, right? So that's why it's really good to like, you know, suck the marrow out of every day and maximize your time on the planet. And, um, you know, if you want to get good at something, it just takes a lot of focused effort. That's one. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because that's one one reoccurring theme we keep hearing too it's like there's no shortcuts it's one percent wins just kind of stacked up and i call it last mile excellence lme which is tied into like play to that back person play the ending of the song with you know exaggerate the passion and and at the last point of the gig maybe you've been playing two hours and you feel like you have nothing left that's the time to to dig deep and even go further so that's fantastic thank you rich um second rich redmond story i'm gonna put a link in the chat guys there's a fantastic video i've i've must have shown this just over and over to almost almost all my students rich you're in a studio in nashville this is the video it's on vimeo so i'm gonna i'm gonna ah. set a, a link in the chat and you were given a song it's like you're hearing it one time and it was where they needed to uh, replace the drum track for whatever reason. So you're hearing it one time yep. and then you go, uh, and as it's playing, you're charting it out in real time, just getting the main points of the song that you need to execute on. And then it's like, now this is a great example of crash because the skill it's like, you know, songs going by your, your jot list down, but you, you know, happy at the same time, keeping your humor, keeping your energy. And then you're like, all right, we've deconstructed the song, heard it one time. And you're like, all right, let's, let's go do a take. You look at the camera, go in, press play. First take ends up being what they use. So it's like <laughs> heard it once, charted it once, played it once. And that was the final take. Now, Jeez. I know, <laughs> I know from my experience and I'm sure everybody here that doesn't, just come, you know, the first time. And as, as we've already talked about, it's like you have to work years and years and years and years to be able to make, make it look that easy. It's like an Olympic athlete. It looks so freaking easy. Oh, well, thank you. Right. So if you, if you could, yeah. Do you, do you remember doing that session or if you could talk about that? Just. Yeah. You know, you know, it, I, I think I know the one you're talking about. Uh, that was my friend, uh, Craig Zarcos. What a nice guy. Um, 
man, unfortunately, he's no longer with us. He's since passed, but he was, uh, you know, we connected and he lives in Oceanside out, outside of San Diego. And I drove to his crib and we were just hanging and he's like, you're the one take guy, right? I was like, well, I mean, you know, we need kind of be at, we, we kind of do that in Nashville. You kind of have to be prepared to have that first take be a keeper that you're going to hear in elevators and department stores and grocery stores for the rest of your life. So the focus has got to really got to be there and your skill level has got to be really high. It's like, all right, I'm going to test you, bro. And we're going to film it. So it was like a whole thing. So he had this band and good drummer, you know, but he had isolated the drum part let me hear it. I charted it out. And then he said, all right, go out there and do it. And so it was kind of a test. So God bless him. And it all worked out that day. And um, he has a fun little song. It's like fun, like indie rock band. It is a fun song. It had, yeah. And I've, I've played it over and over to many students and I've, I've been inspired by it myself. But it's a cool, uh, da -na -na, -da -na, a cool riff. And then, yeah, really cool how you song. interpret it with the attitude, but did you have lots of, um, you know, being in the studio really is like, like it, it, it's scary and it's intense. And I, I, you know, I can't imagine in Nashville with, uh, I've heard stories of like, just every, you know, you're surrounded by assassins and they're expecting <laughs> you ought to deliver one take. Did you ever, how did you deal with like the, the fear and the pressure of just having that one chance? Like I, I saw you playing the Grammys with Jason Aldean and it's like, that's, that's like four minutes of fire and there's no take two. Grammys yeah. are live and it's not like you can, you know, sometimes we play, uh, there's this story my teacher told me of seeing, uh, I think it was Horace Silver. It's an old, old jazz group play. This was probably in the sixties and his band's rehearsing and, uh, th they were taking too long to kind of warm up together. And there were some of them were making excuses like, yeah, I'm, I'm still getting into it. I'm, you know, just give me a couple minutes to kind of get, get the groove. And it's like, no, 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 no. We get the groove like in now, now, like N O W now. So can you talk about that? Just, you know, the red lights on, you got one chance, you're on the Grammys and you got one chance because I know that takes practice and we learn from failure. So I'm sure you've had many, many failures. Yeah. You get to that one take magic that's happening. Yeah. I mean, it just, it just comes from experience, you know, those 10,000 hours that whatever that is, practicing eight hours a day for like six years, you know, if you do start doing the math on something like that. So I think I look back at a lot of the skills that I developed while, you know, from starting to play the drums when I was six years old, um, all the way to, to now. And it's just time in the trenches that you put in, you know, hopefully with a smile on your face. Um, but the Grammys, I remember thinking to myself, oh my God, millions of people are going to be watching here. Do not drop that shaker. <laughs> Cause the first half of the, of the, um, the performance was me just playing a shaker. And then the rest is like, look at, I have got to be in control here. I have to be, I cannot make a mistake. And if you make a mistake, just do it two times. And then everybody thinks it's a theme and you meant to do it. <laughs> wrong, wrong and strong. That's what we say. I like that. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Fantastic. And, um, you know, speaking of the hunger, I think you, you also told a story of, uh, uh, playing, I don't know if it was like a, a rodeo or something. I know it was something dusty. With, with oh, we played a lot of rodeos, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I guess it was Jason Aldean. And then you you were doing drum uh, drum events in the afternoon in schools, and you were telling the story of like, um, you know, I, I don't know if you just moved to Nashville or something, but you're like during the afternoon, I you know I only had one kit, so I tear it down. Oh yeah, bring it through the horse crap and all the dust and stuff. Set it up at a school, play bring the kit back through all that. Can you tell that story really quick? I love, I love yeah. That. Yeah, man. That's well, thank you, man, for knowing that story that, that that's, that's in the book. And that's just speaks to, you know, the kind of focus and hustle, um, that kind of commitment. If you, I was trying to build my reputation as a clinician over a 10 year period, and I had no drum tech with Jason Aldean. So I would have to, um, uh, for the first six, seven years, I was on my own, which meant, and we were playing four or five shows a week and a lot of rodeos. So things are like super dusty. So I had to clean the kit every day. So in the morning, the, my Jason Aldean kit would be dumped off the trailer. I would clean, change heads, tune, set everything up. Then a runner would come pick me up from the venue with another drum set. I would go to a college, high school, or music store, set up that kit, sound check, 
go back to the venue, sound check with my band on that other kit, go back to the music store, do the music store or high school or college event, break that kit down, bring it back, put it in the bay of the bus, have dinner. And well, no, they didn't even get to have dinner. Um, it would just be like, catch the band. And like, usually they said, don't be later than 8.15, Rich, because we would play at 9.15. So we need your energy an hour before the show. So I would go and I would get there back at 8.15, do some more paradiddles, do the show, and then have to break that kit down because I didn't have a drum tech. So, but in the course of those six, seven, eight years, I developed a reputation and a program as a clinician, which was a goal of mine. Check. I was able to achieve that. And then I maintained all that quality control um, while I was building Jason's career. And when you're, when you're your own drum tech, you got to have, be a boy scout. You have to have cleaning supplies. You have to have two of everything, at least two snare drums, at least two pedals. You have to have extra bass drum heads, cymbals. If you crash them, you got to have all your stuff and you have to have a system. And then when you can actually afford a drum tech, or somebody you know, like, and trust that you want to travel with, you can trust, um, you could teach him that system. And then I was lucky enough to find, I went through like two or three guys and I was lucky enough to find my friend Johnny who literally learned everything. He is inside my head. The only thing I have to do is sit behind the drums because sometimes we'll play festivals and there's no sound check and you just have, I have to know and that trust that Johnny has got everything set up perfectly down to the centimeter and I could just sit down and play and be comfortable. Absolutely. And I like that you said something there, vision, which is different than a dream, right? Like a dream, it's great to have dreams, but dreams can be hazy and, and just, oh, I want this, but I don't know. And a vision, it's like you can see it. And I like that to get yeah. through the horse crap and the dust and, the, yeah. and those, those dark moments, you know, instead of going, why am I doing this? I, I have a dream. I want to be a drummer in a band but i don't know versus like i have a vision i've sat mm -hmm. down and deconstructed it i want to be a clinician and this is how it ties into the larger vision and it's here and i need to do so many clinics per year and this is what this is yeah the why the bigger and why. it doesn't happen overnight and that's the thing is that we're living in a society where everything is now and of course i get very impatient like like everyone else i want to i want things now but you know most great things are going to happen in five, 10 years, you know? So, so having that patience and having that vision and having a laser focus and then trying to stay positive through it all as you're building something. Yeah, there's, there's a quote that says something like, um, most people overestimate what they can do in a year. And I mm -hmm. can attest to that. Oh, a year, that's plenty of time to get all that done. And then it's like December, you're like, wow. Didn't yeah. really happen. But people underestimate what they can do in 10 years. 10 years is good. 10 years is yeah. good because I'm looking back, you know, um, I bought a house 10 years ago um, that Jason's career started to really um, upswing 10 years ago. So I'm looking back at the, at the um, you know, the hair went from black to gray and a lot of drum sets came and went and life changes, but there was that, that single focus that I had and it lasted throughout the 10 years. And you could look back at whatever 365 times 10 is 3000 something days, I think. Right. Am I, I'm good on the math there guys. Let me see. I'm sure that sounds good. my dad was an accountant. Yeah. So yeah, 3,650 days, you can do a lot of stuff. Yeah, exactly. And if you think back in 10 years, that, that those 1% wins kind of stacked up like that. Uh, and that's, that's a common thing. It's, it's so cool to speak with, you know, awesome people like yourself. And as we do these LTR live casts every week, it's like going the extra mile when you don't have to. And I want to say to everybody, Rich was like, I, I reached out to you. I, I emailed you. And within like five minutes, you got back to me and it's yeah. like, I'm in exclamation point. And then I'm like, Rich, I want to respect your time. How much time? And you're like, I'm here, man, just whatever you need. And just that, like, you don't, you don't have to be here today and you didn't have to do those clinics in the high school and you don't. Well, we know what it is. We get to. Yeah. You know what I mean, we, we get to do this. And so it's all, it's very cool to see all these smiling faces on here and I'm, I'm happy to be here. So you guys can learn from any, you know, mistakes I made, or if you can get some insights and it could be for, you guys have probably all have different goals or in different seasons of your life. Maybe some of you want to be just really great weekend warriors and play in the best band in town. And maybe some of you guys want to, 
you know, move to the big uh, Canadian music mecca and find your other like-minded people and have a career doing this, and they're both possible. Well, speaking of that, uh, we have a question. I'm just going to see. Oh, yeah. I think I at attitude versus skill. I hope I answered it. The idea. Yeah, Jono, you want to you want to ask you want to get into that with Rich? You can unmute yourself. Yeah. All right. Thanks for doing this, Rich. Appreciate it. Yeah, we've met before, right? You look so familiar. You know what we have? You did a clinic with um, uh, Jeff Salem. Yes. You the saga, and I, I had a chance to watch you. And one of the things that, and it was part of my question that really struck me about you, and I've seen it in some of the other um, LTR livecasts that Chris has hosted, is the really happiness and exuberance. You know, Dom Dom Familiaro shows it, and and definitely we saw that with uh, with with uh, Randy Cook, and it's just great. So just if you could expand on that a little bit, I I feel like it's part of your personality, but I think it's something that likely. It, that you've had to work on as well and project into, into the audience and project. So can you just expand on that a little bit? That'd sure. Sure. Yeah. It's like, like I said, like a- any of those <clears throat> parts of the crash philosophy can be used individually. If you move, you use them together, it's just like the perfect recipe um, to maximize what you want to do in life. But I mean, attitude, like I said, is so important because it's no matter, even if you're the greatest musician on the world, if you have a horrible attitude and you're not fun to be around, you're not likable, people aren't going to want to give you that opportunity a second time. So that's very, very important. It's a way for you to say, if someone cracks the door for me, if somebody gives me an opportunity and cracks that door, I'm going to kick that door open. And then I want to make them look really good. It's my way of thanking them for the opportunity by just knocking it out of the ballpark. As far as the skill, the showmanship I just man I never had a problem with showmanship I think that we play our personality on the instrument more than any other instrument um the guitar and the drums it's like everybody says look at John Mayer now we know exactly what he looks like in the bedroom because he's making those faces right and it's like it's because music is a window to the soul it really really is it's it it connects to us at the deepest levels and we project our personality so I'm a really outgoing person and and I'm like a five-year-old um just ask my girlfriend. She calls me her 50 year old man going on to <laughs> act like a five year old. And I will own it. You know, I'll, I don't want to get old in my spirit. Right. And playing the drums is such a fun, youthful, exuberant thing. So I never had a problem twirling sticks or sweating on the drums or winking at the bass player. And then over the years, you can refine some of these things. And you can turn them into actual like showman techniques. So if you want to learn from great showmans, show men it would be like guys like you know gene krupa and who passed the baton to you know ringo who had this was spreading the butter on the hi-hat at shea stadium and shaking his head to the beat and then you have guys like carmine apathy that was like twirling his sticks and double china boys and and everybody keeps passing the baton you know it's and so um it's the entertainment industry so yeah if i'm playing a wedding or a a jazz brunch, I'm probably not going to be twirling my sticks. But if you get me in front of 10,000 people and they are ready to party and they are drinking and it's just, woo, I mean, I'm in, I want to be part of that party. I want to lead the party. So, um, you kind of have to know the situation, but I've been known to twirl my sticks in the recording studio and I get heat for that. But you know what? It makes everybody on the floor connect to you like you're in a live performance. And here's the idea. Why do they call it a recording? A record is a recording of a performance that's captured in time for all time. That's why you can't ever mail in a performance. And listen to those Motown guys, right? You got seven, eight, nine guys on the floor at the same time. And there's so much humanity and spirit in those recordings. Um, I just got goosebumps thinking about Mm. the two drummers and then the tambourine player. And then there's a guy that's literally just stomping quarter notes on a piece of wood. And there's a mic on the piece of wood and there's a horn section and there's a singer and they're all in this little building together. Oh my God. I hope that never changes. That's the way we record Jason Aldean records, which is very exciting. That's awesome. Thank you very much. Yeah, Yeah, man. Yeah. Wow. That's fantastic. Yeah. That gave me goosebumps too. That's Absolutely. Yeah, the magic, the magic, right? Uh, we mm-hmm. have a question. Now, he's not, he's at the cottage and there's no Wi Fi. So they typed ah. in, 
and I think you're going to watch the re replay, but they typed in uh, a question here, and it's from my awesome student, Ryland. And Ryland's uh, in his teens, and he has, he has a dream to keep this a big part of his life and, and maybe make drumming a, a, a full-time thing. And we've definitely been talking about it in terms of, of the crash system and, and, you know, being a great person to be around. But in terms of just somebody that's, you know, in their teens and working towards this, um, do you have anything to, to say to how, how someone would uh, go about that? That maybe, maybe it's something we haven't covered before, because I, I like how we've, we've uh, touched upon it's, not that big audition that you think it is, although that's mm -hmm. important, but it's like those moments where you think no one's watching you, right? But and they always are. They always are, and, and where you're really being tested. But if you could just yeah. talk to Rylan about that. So the idea that he wants to cultivate a career in the music business, he's a teenager. Yes. Okay. And he's, at, and, and he's asked, actually, he's fantastic. He's asking the same question to everybody. Oh, nice. And just accumulating all the answers and making it work for him. So it's really Well, now is a really wonderful time to be a student if you're a self-starter because um, every, you know, back in the day, we would have our like, you know, Randy Castillo hot licks videos on um, VHS and we would it. pirate VHSs from each other and we'd have to rewind things and then the tape would get eaten, you know, all destroyed. And we're living in a time where there is so much material out there if you want to do great hands for life with Tommy Igo or if you want to jump on a, um, you know any of these Aaron Sterling is a big LA studio drummer and he put a, a program together you know I have a program and it's like you could just steal from everybody it's all on your laptop it's mostly all stuff that's just streaming so if you want to work on a, a one-handed role, you can study with Johnny Rab. If you want to work on left foot clave, you could do it. If you want to work on double bass, you could take lessons with Thomas Lang. So maybe, you know, pick a lane of something that really resonates with you. So at the beginning and the end of the day, I'm an overeducated rock drummer. I like Elton John. I like Billy Joel. I like Rod Stewart. I like Americana music. I like storytelling set to big rock guitars, right? That's kind of like my lane. And then around that, I have all this other experience that can, that can help make you marketable as, as a working musician. So I'm telling you two things at the same time. I'm telling you to be really freaking good at one thing. And I'm telling you to also be really good at a million other things, which is if you like there's, playing in a wedding band or a corporate party band is amazing training because you're going to play music from the 1920s to now. Right. And you've got to touch all that stuff. British invasion, new wave, Motown, yeah. stack, Chicago blues, top 40 classic rock. That's going to make you a great musician, right? It's going to make you more marketable. Um, so I would just say study, 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 practice, 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 because once 21 hits, and maybe there's a girlfriend and maybe there's a mortgage and then the girlfriend becomes a wife and then there's a honey do list and then there's kids and, and then life gets out of hand really quickly. And then you have less and less and less time to work on your crap. So being 16 years old, you can get your 10,000 hours in before your 21st birthday, which is a great thing. And if you want, you can go the traditional education route as well. You can go to say a college like, Berkeley or University of Miami or um, UCLA or the University of North Texas, or you can go to more of like maybe um, a Metalworks or a Musicians Institute in Hollywood where it's like, we're going to give you two years and we're, we're going to give you this piece of paper. It's really just a piece of paper. But what you come out with is that education, that time in the trenches, and then maybe some relationships with students that are really coming from around the globe. So when I teach a Musicians Institute, there's people from Paraguay, Paraguay, Colombia, Newfoundland, Japan, and you know that becomes your your network of people, and your network is your net worth, right? And so like I don't want to put money into the equation, but you need it. You need at least a certain amount of money to pay rent, have reliable transportation, have clothes on your back maybe a cell phone, right? And, and so to do that all from drumming is very challenging. You have to be good. And then you have to figure out how to be somewhat of a good business person. So being um, present on the socials and then returning all your emails, texts, direct messages in a timely manner 
having some sort of a website, and then just having the business chops to maybe take a relationship from the internet into the real world. As soon as we can get back into the real world and it's okay to hug people, oh my God, I can't wait. I, I mean, I'm just, I cannot wait to do that. But that's a skill, you know, starting a relationship in cyberspace and then making the effort to bring it into the real world and then cultivating that relationship. So you really have to have everything. You got to have your skill set together and then you have that have to have that laser focus, maybe a plan um, to move to a major metropolitan market in um, Canada. And, um, and that is going to help because it's like the watering hole in that, in the Savannah, like you're going to see, zebras and elephants that are fearing for their life but they really need that water and so they're looking out for the cheetahs and the leopards and the lions and you know who the cheetahs and the leopards and the lions are those are the drummers that are better than you right they're always going to be there but you might as well be in a place where there is no ceiling where you can continue to grow and take chances and make connections. And each of those, like, look at Randy cook, Randy cook is Canadian, proud Canadian. And he said, you know what, I'm going to make a, make a change and move to Los Angeles. And that's when his career went because he started meeting um, because Los Angeles is an entertainment capital of the world. Right? So you're going to meet all sorts of people, Korean pop artists, Chinese pop artists, Columbia, European art, and they need drummers. And they go to New York and LA to find those musicians, right? And then there's the Nashville thing, which is like, got to get really good at just playing a three minute song and not playing any licks and the collecting the check and being happy with that. Because I'm probably going to do um, a couple of records in June and I will probably will not play one drumistic thing right? All the, all the things that I'm playing are going to be in servitude of the song. And a lot of like drummers that love technical stuff are just going to like fast forward through the track. Cause they're like, I can do that. But here's the deal. You're not, you're not doing it because you didn't take the chance to change your life, to swim with the sharks, to drink the water with the cheetahs and the lions on your butt the whole time going, mmm, tasty morsel. You have to be ready to take those chances in life and put yourself in the right place to be successful. To risk, Does that make sense? hundred percent to risk the failure and to, mm -hmm. and, and I like that what you said about the actual drumming, which is the boom schmack, right? Just yeah. the, the simplicity of it. And that's like, the more I drum, I've been drumming over three decades and it's like the depth of just a quarter note or like a simple boom schmack and how, skill that takes to do that at such a high level is just mine. Yeah. I mean, guys, try, try just playing quarter notes on a ride cymbal, you know, with or without a metronome for like an hour and just see if you can hear a symphony orchestra in there. See if you can hear a bass player playing. Ding, 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 dung, go, do you like right? Phil Rudd and ACDC, like at that level, how does he do it? It's like, yeah, Phil, Phil Rudd is a genius and he's back there. He isn't playing overly hard but every kick and snare is perfectly placed it feels epic it feels so good even without a click track and he can keep 80,000 people in a soccer stadium in South America all bobbing their head at the same time while he's smoking a cigarette <laughs> don't okay? smoke everybody but yeah but but that is something to aspire to right that's incredible you know how much power the drummer has and it's a lot of responsibility it's like being spider-man it's like with great power comes great responsibility right <laughs> yeah he, he's smoking a cigarette because he's laid back and relaxed that that's kind of the thing it's like relaxed intensity and you just but it doesn't drag it, it, it's magic what he does and and yeah. it's boom schmack but it's like oh my god and i, I want to point out something that you said that i hope everybody caught especially rylan in his question which is diversification now, Gene Simmons, I'm going to call you the Gene Simmons of drummers, and you'll see why. Because Gene Simmons, he said this great thing. I never forgot it. He said, I am a marketer. I am a musician. I am a songwriter. I am an author. And I am a TV producer. I think those were the things. And he's definitely done all of those things. And he said, I'm technically not qualified to do any of those things. It's like, wow. I, I don't have a diploma in 
you know, bass playing arts. I don't uh, have a marketing diploma, et cetera, et cetera. He's like, I j it's like what you said. I just did it. I had, you know, the attitude to, to, to swim with the sharks. And if you want to write a book, you know, sit in front of that blinking cursor every day, write the book. If you want to drum, get behind the kit and start to fail and just keep doing it. And, you know, just being diversified in, in many different things. Like for yourself, you produce DVDs, you have your own talk show now. You're an author. <laughs> and, and can you just talk a bit about diversify? You know, you, I know you have songwriting credits, which yeah. is so much more than just like paradiddles on a pad. Can you talk about diversification? Sure, sure. Yeah. You know, the thing with, um, with uh, Gene Simmons is that he just had an undying belief in himself, you know what I mean? Right. And it's like having that inner confidence to quiet down that voice that says, you know, you're not good enough. It's not going to happen. You want to, you want to listen to that other voice that is like, you can do this. And even if you're as nervous and you're quaking in your boots, you just have that never let them see you sweat, show up, go through the fear, you know, um, you know, I've tried all these things. Yeah. I, I, I had a publishing deal for six years and I was able to write with these world-class, um, songwriters and I was able to get three number one songs in Australia. So my check just wow. came the other day, 140 bucks, right? What am I going to do with that? Maybe I'll tuck it away. I'll let it collect some interest. I'm not going to retire on that. But, um, and that speaks to the idea that you have to constantly be growing, evolving and changing. You don't want to be rotting on the vine. So the songwriting game has changed because of file sharing. So a person that we used to have a hit song years ago, there a million dollars would show up into their in their uh, in their bank account, and now it's like less than one third of that, right? And then you have taxes and all that stuff. But most of these people write songs because it's their passion, it's their purpose, it's what they do. So they have to evolve and grow with that. And then there was producing records. I was able to produce some records and help the careers of people like Parmalee and Thompson Square and um, Lindsay L like helping procure record deals and then getting in the room and sweating blood for them and not only playing drums but like having insights to the entire big big picture project and then um, teaching is great because it helps you become better at what you do because you have to figure out a way to effectively communicate what you are feeling and doing right so teaching is always great even if you're a new drummer and you just have you have some pretty good technique and you know the rudiments you can teach a first, you know, day drummer. You could do some, some lessons with, with, you just have to be a step ahead of the student and stay ahead of the student. And then um, I just, you know, I love, um, I've always wanted to explore acting and TV hosting and voiceover. And uh, I just jumped in head first. And, and I know it's incredibly difficult, maybe even more difficult in the music business, but it's that same thing. I just jump in head first. Somebody's going to get the job why not you? Right. So, um, looking back, would I have been this diverse, like from the get go? No, because for the first 25 years of my life, I only wanted to play the drums and see if I could get that job, find my Jason Aldean. And because I was able to find my Jason Aldean and help build that, um, while you're doing that, it's nice to like invest in yourself. People say like, what's better, buy Apple stock or invest in you? It's always better to invest in you. If there's something that you're interested in, pour that money into you. And it costs money to write books and it costs money to take acting lessons and it costs money to have a state of the art website. I, this is, I'm just constantly, <laughs> right? But the product is me, and essentially, I'm my own boss, right? So that's kind of a fun thing. Yes, I'm always going to have to answer to a band, a songwriter, a producer, the city of Nashville, the city of Los Angeles, the culture there. There's a lot of power players that are above me that I have to answer to. But essentially, I'm doing something as an entrepreneur, as a creative, and essentially, I'm my own boss, which is a fun thing. It really is. Yeah, that's outstanding. And, and yeah, for a moment, I mean, if you could... Look at everything you do on a page. That's awesome. Like teaching, acting, speaking, author, and it all adds up kind of the yeah. same thing. What, what, do you, what do you think would, would most affect the drumming? Or maybe they all kind of affect the drumming. Because the, the LTR concept is like life's a rhythm. We are who we play. Like you, you talked about at the beginning. Your personality 
is who you are on the drums. Did right. any of those things unexpectedly like impact you as a drummer? Like maybe the acting or the writing or? Um, I think that all these creative pursuits, they all co-mingle and cross-pollinate because um, when, I, when, when I get a script or I have to study a scene um, to go to my acting class, it's like you can break it down in rhythmic chunks and, 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 and there's so much music in language and communication. And so musical training will help all sorts of areas of your life. And then, you know, the acting thing, which is like communicating with another human being, being present, listening, it's the same thing. You know, acting is reacting and most of it is listening, 99%. Same thing with music. I'm not going to know what to play on a song unless I listen to the lyrics and the vibe and I'm getting input from an artist and a producer and the band on the floor and the songwriter. And so all this information is coming through to me and I have to make quick judgments. I have to make decisions. Actors make decisions. And um, the thing about like, say, you know, hosting a, a show, so hosting a, a talk show, which is essentially, it's like an overproduced podcast. You know, the same thing is being in the moment with another human being and making it about my guest. I like to, I like to find commonalities in our journey. And like, we, maybe we have similar stories over the same age, but it's always about the guest. Just like when I'm drumming, it's always about the song. It's always about the artist. It's always about making my band feel completely comfortable. So I feel like all these creative pursuits are literally the same thing. Obviously, the skills needed to um, execute at the high level in each of them is slightly different, but it's all the same. It's about listening, being in the moment, being an effective communicator, and you always have to have heart. If you don't have the heart, then your drumming is just like, Ting ting ka ka tika ting ka ka ta tum pa pa de pa do pa ga do crash rock exercise number two from the second page of rock drumming made easy right and eh, horrible right and it's the same right. thing with any other pursuit you don't want to see you know the reason why Ryan Seacrest hosts every talent uh, every show on television because he is such an effective communicator he can think on his feet he can improvise these television shows these hosts Terry Crews on um, The Voice or whatever he's on right now, um, America's Got Talent, he's improvising. You know, there's a script, there's a, there's, a, there's a teleprompter, but he is improvising and he's charismatic as hell. And that charisma is the same thing like playing the drums for 20,000 people. So I don't know, I just have this philosophy that it all kind of works together. Yeah, it does. That's, that's, uh, that's fantastic. I love that. Like, I really see it as, as a servant leader. And that's what I'm hearing you say. It's like we're serving, but leading it simultaneously at the same time. Yes. That's really the drums, right? Like serving, but in the back. And we all know like a band, you cannot have it without the drummer. The drummer makes it, breaks the band. It's the most powerful instrument. We love it. Yeah. Anybody have a question for Rich? Unmute yourself. Because I got 99 more. Don't be, uh, yeah. Don't be shy, guys question james how you doing i'm doing great i'm doing great hey rich uh how you doing, big james? Fan here. i'm doing great thanks for being with us today um i had a question regarding um um if if you have a limited amount of time to practice on any day um i know for myself i'm trying to balance a job while trying to be a professional drummer. And often I find, uh, you know, I'm faced with a limited amount of time to practice. Not always, but again, on, on certain days. Are there any um, specific ideas or concepts that you find you would go to um, often in those situations if you're limited mm -hmm. to time? Are there specific exercises or ideas, whether it's developing your, your time or your groove, that you would always try and hit in that yeah, yeah. time. Well, time and groove are something you're, you know, the basics. So your rudiments, you know, your touch, your technique, uh, finger control, stroke, all that stuff. You will be revisiting that your entire life. Look at somebody like Joe Morello um, uh, or who was the guy that Jim Chapin, like to the day he yeah. died, he had the sticks in his hand, man. He loved to practice. So you'll always be um, re re revisiting that. And then you always have to keep your time and your groove and your feel. That's so, so, so important. 
Um, if you want to work on like cruise ships or movie scores or jingles, or if you have a home studio where you need to be able to write charts out quickly, you want to work on your reading. It's just a cool thing to do to work on your reading, but it's not necessary for every type of musician. Um, but I always worked on my reading. So in college, let's say I only had three hours to practice. So maybe the first hour would be playing um, with a metronome. Um, the second hour would be reading things I've never seen before. And then the third hour would be working on the jazz charts that I would need because we would have a, ja a fall jazz concert. So then you need to find out what are the things I need to work on on a regular basis so you can take your time, even if you only have an hour. So in an hour, you can work on warming up. So you're working on your technique. You can work on maybe a beat coordination, playing with a click, and then read something you've never read before every day. And so uh, with me, I'm at a point in my career where I don't necessarily always like playing the drums by myself. I would rather almost play in a room with bad musicians than like sometimes play by myself. I love that human interaction of playing with other musicians. So um, the things that I work on are things that I would, I need to, for practical application. So I have a clinic coming up. I have a little tour coming up. I have new Jason Aldean songs to learn. We have a tour coming up and I need to dust off everything. Um, I got the sticks in my hands right now. So I'm working on air doubles, air paradiddles, air flams, <laughs> flam taps, and you could do it on your leg, you know, just keep that thing going. You could do it on a pillow. Pillow has no rebound, you know? Um, so it really depends on you. And I'd have to do an evaluation of like where you are in your career and where I think you could, but the idea is to take that practice time you have and divide it into quadrants. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it. I was going to ask you the practice question too. And, and um, I'll, I'll share with everybody just something I recently learned is like uh, in a, from a scientific view, you can be sad while writing, painting, just doing a lot of different, different uh, hobbies and art forms and things like that. But you cannot physiologically be sad while you dance. It's impossible. So while you're dancing, your body will not let you be sad. What That's is incredible? Drumming? It is. I just learned this like two days ago. It's dancing. Drumming, you're dancing on the pedals. Really is dancing. Yeah, you're having to move to feel like I've always tried to be one of those drummers that literally is just sitting there and is just like totally upright, no faces. <laughs> I sound horrible because I have to move my body to the quarter no pulse or to some sort of subdivision and then who knows what's going on up here you know i'm not doing anything on my face on purpose it's just a visceral reaction to the music making in the moment yeah and and, and there's a great video I'll, I'll share in the chat do you remember rich uh i think it was one of your students put together the the, the drum faces of rich hilarious oh it's the best and and i see myself on tape and i see all my students and it's like you, you just it's like an unconscious expression of passion and i find like you know we're all going through a lot of anxiety a lot of challenges right now a lot of isolation like you said like playing with real musicians there's something technology has not figured out is how do we jam while going through something like this and yeah you could be in isolation booths or something but we can't do it on the internet yet and that's something you know i'm hearing over and over again something we really miss including myself yeah. So one thing, the drum, I would say the drums are there for you and that, that dancing, you can't be sad and dance. I've noticed that sometimes I'm like, man, I'm so overwhelmed. We're all going through challenges. When I just sit and just even play some of my old, really practicing maybe to learn a skill, but just my old favorite songs I played when I was a kid, the Zeppelin, sure. musical graffiti, stuff like that. I'm like, when I'm done, I'm better. Like it's like yeah. an antidepressant. I always yeah. feel better. That's great. That's a great, that's a great takeaway. Yeah. I can't, I can't wait to play. It's going to be, it's, it's going to be awesome. At the same time, um, you know, sometimes taking a break can be good, especially if you have the tens of thousands of hours of muscle memories, you know what I mean? Like I feel like, Oh, I haven't really been picking up the sticks as much because I've been spending the last two, uh, two months doing other things. My band is on break, but I get these things in my hand and all that time in the trenches, it comes right back. So just depending on where you are, if you feel like you could put the sticks down for a week and you want to, um, take care of all that Netflix stuff uh, that you want to watch or you want to um, start a 
uh, start painting or you want to start a new hobby or those books that are on your nightstand that are that are adding up or all that stuff uh you know working out trying a new workout regimen pushing yourself hey i dr- i uh, ran 6 miles yesterday how about 7 today you know so like just trying different things and then let yourself off the hook you know but you know don't do it too long you know you want to get back in the trenches and keep your progress on your instrument moving forward you know yeah that that that's well put i i like the you know, the value of rest and the value of taking a break. Like when this crisis hit, the last thing I needed was like more stuff in my head and more stuff to accomplish. I just ended up just playing to kind of soothe myself and just to have fun. But then, you know, we've been in this crisis for a few weeks. I'm starting to notice like I'm getting a little soft just keeping that practice going, like playing to the songs that I already know. I need to be challenged too. So Yeah, yeah and that's very, very important. You guys, you're not, you're not developing – you're you're not developing if you're always just jamming to the same music you grew up on it's like great to revisit but at the same time i think that it's greater it's a great thing to be overqualified to play any particular music right so sit, say you never are going to play burning bebop jazz or you know uh get it all the latin stuff it's okay. You should still work on it and have that in your bag of tricks. And those skills are going to inform basic stuff. So when I just play, Oosh, Ash, Oosh, Ash, yes, I played along with Bonham, but I also played along with a million other things that inform how I play that thing, right? So if you explore and you're open-minded and you're not a musical snob, it's going to really help you. You know, and now that we have Spotify, there's no excuses because you can type in a songwriter's name, an artist's name, a style. Everyone's got playlists. You can organize your own playlist by styles, feels, tempos, drummers. You want to explore Jeff Percaro? Put together a Jeff Percaro playlist. Put together a Kenny Aronoff playlist. Put together a Nigel Olson playlist. And that's how that stuff's going to soak into your DNA. When I was going to college in North Texas State, I had a 30-minute drive every day from Louisville, Texas to Denton, Texas. and for about two years, I listened to pretty much only fusion and big band music. And so when I was at North Texas, I was so consumed with that style. And I was there with Keith Carlock. I was there with um, Adam Gust. I was there with uh, Blair Sinta. And we were on our journey to get this stuff into our DNA so that even if we ended up just joining a cumbia band or playing in an ACDC tribute band, we were going to bring us some interesting element to that, our own take on it. That's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, did, I want to be respectful of your time, Rich. Thank you so much for doing this today. Oh, yeah. Does anybody have a question for Rich or you just want to say hi, unmute yourself? Hey, Rich. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm just wondering uh, if you had to learn, if you had to learn, yeah, hey, you had to learn a, a song or a track on the spot, what would be the top things you'd look for if you were just mm. like throw, thrown into that? Sure, sure. So um, I think the more you do that, that's why playing in a wedding band or top 40 bands are great because when I was in a top 40 band, we'd have to learn that new Coolio or Janet Jackson song every week, you know, so we were learning two, three songs a week and you get really good at figuring out the, the guts or the anatomy of what makes a popular music song. So, you know, there's going to be an intro, there's going to be a verse, there's probably going to be a pre-chorus, a chorus, a turnaround, a second verse, a second chorus, a solo, a bridge, or a breakdown, maybe a false chorus or a double chorus, and a tag and an outro. So that's the guts of popular music. So you'll get it, you'll get really good at recognizing these things. And at the very least, you want to be able to scribble scribble out a chart, like an anatomical chart of like four bar intro, verse, seven measures, stop on beat one of the eighth measure. And I, I'm picturing this in my mind's eye. I'm writing it all out. And um, that'll help you get through the song, okay? And then if there's any stops or hits or if the producer suggests anything or the artist, you have to be, I, I write it down on my chart. And since I have my own little system, I can write that down and then try to get a first take. Um, and in Nashville, we have a thing called the Nashville number system. So if you're open to that, my good buddy Jim Riley wrote a book on it. So just Google Nashville number system, Jim Riley. I learned it on the job, but say you make your, you make a trip to Nashville 
you play the Grand Ole Opry, you play a recording session, you play a showcase, you're going to see this Nashville number chart and it's all based on numbers, but each number is just four beats, right? And it's, and you just get the hang of it, but the, the, uh, you'll be able to develop, develop this skill by practicing. So I would just turn on like foreigners greatest hits back in the seventies. I would drop the needle, dirty white boy, you know, or like, there's a four bar phrase, right? I write the four bar phrase down. Right. And then because I'm, I have the classical training, I could write down, you know, I can write it down. So um, that stuff comes in handy as well. If you can't read music, what would you write? Lick. You would write lick. And then, which is a disadvantage, right? That's where the classical notation also comes in hand. So if you can marry the classical notation with your own system of creating a chart, you're going to be unstoppable. Felix already is unstoppable. Yeah. He's a fantastic drummer and great guy. And just, you look like you're in a, a bunker, Felix, that could withstand the next world war and you could just yeah. go through it, man. So I, I like where you're at right now. Yeah. It looks like you have like canned goods down there and masks and agent yeah. orange and all sorts of stuff down there. He's been there for two months. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you, Rich. And, and I want to uh, just point out something you said. What I, I was lucky to spend some time with uh, Jim Blackley before he passed. He's a great uh, jazz drummer and, and educator, an amazing human being, one of the Yodas of, of drum drummers out there. And from day one, he was always like, get the band, make it your number one goal to get the band to trust you. Mm. Get the band to trust you. And you mentioned it at yeah. the of our session today. And that comes from like being a servant leader, having all the skills, listening. Could you talk about that? That just for a sec, like getting the band to trust you. Yeah. Well, I, I'm lucky because I found um, two guys that I've been playing with since like 1997. That's a long time. That's a lot of presidencies. Um, and we met um, collectively a young Jason Aldean in 1999. That's 21 years. And we just started playing together. And as a general rule, in those early days, I would have a little Tama rhythm watch and I would take a little in-ear monitor and I would run it down my shirt and I would have it in just one side. And we were using wedges back then. So there'd be a wedge on the right side so I can hear the vocal and the kick drum. And if you ever just have to have one, two things in your wedge, kick drum, vocal, that way you're feeling the groove from the ground up and you're hearing the person sing that's cutting your check, right? And then everything else is icing on the cake. And so... I wanted to make us great. I wanted to make us unstoppable. I wanted to make us so tight that we were like a Mack truck. Like, have you heard these guys? They're so, that was our goal. And we had a similar goal. So I would play with the rhythm watch and I, and I would, could lock down tempos because let's face it, there's a big difference between 84, 85 and 86 BPM, right? So at a showcase, a lot of times we would crank up the, the um, tempo, live tempo, two beats, and then we would lock that down. And then playing with a click track allows you to kind of almost train the band into a muscle memory of where that song needs to be every night. So I'm lucky I had the trust of my friends. I had the trust of Jason Aldean. And we were able to cultivate this kind of fun feel together that, that we've been able to cultivate over 21 years so that's very difficult i know there's a lot of guys that are playing in bar bands on friday and saturday night and sometimes the only time you see that band is on friday and saturday night and it takes practice to play collectively with a click track especially if only one person in the band has it that's how we were doing it back in the day so if there was a guitar intro i'd be like one two three and i'd have the hat chirping away right to keep us all honest and do, 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 boom, ba, boom, ba, we're in, right? Um, and then as the technology progressed and we got in-ear monitors, we started running click tracks. like, ch, 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 ch. And then we got so good at that, that it was, wasn't a big deal to be able to play that tight together with a click track in front of 20,000 people, which is what everybody's doing now. You go to see Taylor Swift, you go see Lady Gaga, you go see any Blake yeah. Shelton, all those bands are playing with clicks and loops and tracks. And hopefully it, it doesn't sound super stiff. I mean, th those guys wouldn't have that job with that artist if they couldn't pull that off. So 
hopefully you meet the right people that will trust you and you say, look, it, I want to make us great. You hired me because you love my drumming. Trust me. Let's do this thing together. And that way we'll have that consistency because I hate playing for songwriters that are like, speed it up. Slow it down. Too. What are we doing here, guys? Let's pick the tempo and stick to it. It's only three minutes of our life. So it could be great joy for those three minutes, or it could be three minutes of this guy, you know, giving you dirty looks. A click track saves the day because you have that consistency that you can rely on. And another trick is if you want, is you could just have the light and you could watch the light. And you could just rely on your really good inner clock that you've been working on all these years. And then when the bridge comes, you could check yourself. And if it's like red, green, red, green, you're like, all right, we're there, man. This is good. And then, of course, tape yourself, record yourself. You'll hear a lot of stuff. Have you ever recorded yourself, Rich, and you hear the moments where you're like, man, I played that, I played that fill for me. And I stomped on what the guitarist was doing. And you it's like a micro failure and you make a note. Okay. Next time don't do that. You kind of build it up. Absolutely. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Like we record every night. So there's like somewhere floating around there. There's um, 12, 13, 14 years of Jason Aldean concerts on a hard drive somewhere. And, you know, I, I would make it a point of listening to a lot of things. And then right before we go out and, and uh, rehearse for a tour, I'll listen to the last live recording. So I have that frame of reference of all the choices and everything I was making. And I also have charts for all the songs. So we're going to be off for six and seven months. And then when I get back with the band, I've got the exact arrangements, tempos, everything notated. So by being a boy scout and being over-prepared by being the most prepared out of your band, yep. that's another way that you can garner trust. I love that beat. Go the extra mile. That's we keep hearing this all the time. Uh, Rich, thank you so much. Can you end with the, uh, what was the concept of the guy with the, you said like, I think of the click track as Horacio. Jose. Jose. That's, Jose, man. Yeah, no, the reason why he's Jose is because he's a badass Latin American percussionist, man. And he's in my head and he's like, we got this, man, we got this. And we're together, we're a team. And he's playing shaker. And he's like winking at me. He's like, yeah, Ricardo, you know? Uh, he's in my head. I love this guy. We go everywhere together. And um, so I just, if you, and he could be anything. He could be, he could be um, Italian, Greek, Croatian. He could be a Newfoundlander. He could be a New Zealander. He could be what he could be whatever you want. But you can create a character who's playing those claves, who's playing those shakers, and you treat it like another musician. Because when I play with a percussionist, I want I want us to lock together with this beautiful rhythmic fabric. And another thing you could learn along the way is playing percussion. Like mm. get play percussion on gigs with a live drummer you learn so much about choices that other drummers make. Are they leaving space for you? Are they listening to you? And you'll get really good at putting textures together. Like you know that a LP soft shake works really good on the first verse. And then on the second verse, then you go to a tambourine and a, the Cyclops on beat four, and then there's a turnaround and you could pick up the maracas for the second verse and oh, here comes the bridge and then you go to your congas and you have your then it's tambourine all the way out and you'll learn so much. Do you have to chase the drummer? Do you, are you dancing around the part or is he just lay it down? You know, you'll learn so much by playing percussion. That's awesome. Well, thank you, Rich. We can feel your your just gratitude your energy your positivity and just your servant leadership and, and how much you give through just like every word of the session and every beat you play guys rich has a book rich has dvds he's got his own show like check out everything he does richredmond.com i'm gonna uh, oh we got don famulero on wednesday we're gonna do a deep dive into stick control it's gonna be awesome so that's the next uh, live cast. Guys, I'm going to unmute everybody. Show your gratitude for Rich. He gave you so much today and gave me and inspired us. Uh, thank you, thank man. you Thanks, man. That was awesome. You guys, you guys are a good looking team, man. And um, I'm easy to find. And please keep in touch. And you got a great teacher. You're in great hands. So God bless everybody. Stay safe.